All right, well, welcome everybody. Hello to all of our College of Engineering alumni and friends. We're so glad to welcome you to our quarter, our winter quarter edition of Engineering on Tap. Uh, I'm Erin Freesha. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and Network Strategy for the college, and I am so, so glad that you could log on with us this afternoon. Um, it's good to see some new faces. It's good to see some familiar faces. Um, all right, so Engineering on Tap was launched in 2019. It has been a way for us to connect with our Aggie engineer community and learn something new about the College of Engineering. Tonight, we are excited to share with you about the college's strategic vision for next level research and learn something about the amazing interdisciplinary research currently taking place. Um, first, we will hear from Dr. Raisa D'Souza, Associate Dean for Research, followed by Professor Heather Bischel, Professor Marina Leite, and Professor Shinfan Lin. All right, I'm going to share some housekeeping notes with you all, but I hope that you will take a moment to share in the chat uh, your UC Davis class and class year and major, or your UC Davis affiliation, uh, where you're joining us from, and your favorite spot on the UC Davis campus. And feel free to send a chat shout out to any friends or familiar faces that you see as well. All right, housekeeping. This event is being recorded and we will post it to the College of Engineering's YouTube channel next week. Um, we ask that you please submit any questions that you have for our presenters to Dr. Raisa D'Souza as she will be moderating our Q&A session. So if you choose the chat option to send those directly to her, that will uh, help immensely. We're going to do Q&A after each presentation, uh, at which point you can also raise your hand to unmute and ask your question live as time permits. And finally, stick around to make sure you are part of the raffle at the very end of our event today. We're doing two $25 e-gift cards to the UC Davis bookstore so that you can stock up on all your Aggie gear. All right. And now... I am very pleased to introduce our moderator and our first speaker for this evening, Associate Dean for Research, Dr. Raisa D'Souza. In addition to her role as Associate Dean, Dr. D'Souza is a professor in the Department of Computer Science and the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, and she's been a faculty member at UC Davis for the past 18 years. Dr. D'Souza received a PhD in Statistical Physics from MIT in 1999. She is a fellow of the American Physical Society and the Network Science Society and has received numerous honors. She is currently lead editor at Physical Review Research and on the board of reviewing editors at Science. Dr. D'Souza is highly successful researcher and team builder, and she plays a central role in advancing the college's goal to engineer a better world by developing and overseeing new initiatives both across the college and between the college and strategic partners at UC Davis and beyond. But I'll let her tell you more about that. All right, take it away, Raisa. Thank you. So thank you everybody for joining us this evening and um, hearing about some of the exciting things that we're doing in the college. We really appreciate your support and your time. So uh, as Erin mentioned, I'm Raisa D'Souza. I'm the Associate Dean of Research. And I thought that I would just start out by telling you a little bit about myself. So I became the Associate Dean of Research in July, so about seven months ago. So I thought I'd just give you a little overview of how I came to, into this position. So um, I am, like many people, the children of immigrants, and education was always highly valued in my family. And I grew up in Chicago, so I went to my undergraduate degree at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, and I studied computational physics. And I managed to get a fellowship to go get my PhD in theoretical physics from MIT uh, in 1999, like Aaron said, quite a while ago. And from there, I went on to do two postdoc positions. So my first postdoc was at Bell Labs, and I was in the theoretical physics and the fundamental math departments. And it got me thinking about networks. So I learned a lot about statistical physics in my education. And I started thinking about how I could apply that to network systems when I went to Lucent Technologies Bell Labs. And from there, I went and did a postdoc at Microsoft Research in the theoretical computer science group. So 
it really synthesized my research agenda, which is using statistical physics to understand complex networks and complex systems. And up until that point, all my training had been in theoretical physics and theoretical computer science. And I started looking around for faculty jobs and I applied to a lot of physics jobs and computer science jobs. And I found this one engineering job that was really very intriguing. And I had never interacted that deeply with engineers before. And I was so impressed because I started interacting with engineers and they were asking questions like, how can we help people? And I thought, wow, that's really refreshing. And so in the fall of 2005, I joined the College of Engineering here at UC Davis when I started in mechanical and aerospace engineering. And after I achieved my tenure, I wanted to align my research and my teaching goals a little more closely. And I uh, was uh, able to uh, shift my position a little bit and become joint between mechanical and aerospace engineering and computer science, which is a really nice marriage that supports the type of research that I do. So I just wanted to give you two slides about work on complex networks and complex systems. So what is a complex system? A complex system is a system that has large scale emergent collective behaviors. So these are behaviors that we wouldn't have predicted from knowing in detail the constituent equations of motion of every element in the system. These are things like synchronization of firefly colonies or pattern formation of frost on a window pane. Uh, we also see a lot of phase transitions in emergent uh, behaviors. So tipping points where the behavior is very different on one side versus the other. And I'll tell you more about that in the second slide. And I study a lot of things like cascading failures in stock markets, in epileptic brains, in power grids. And another really important collective behavior, of course, is looking at the emergence of intelligence and beyond that, the emergence of consciousness. So um, what I really focus on is looking at how we are dependent upon a collection of interdependent networks in modern society. So we have social networks and we can think about a biological network, say a virus that mutates on the whole protein and genomic interaction networks. It spreads on social networks by human contacts. Those are abetted by uh, long range links that come from transportation networks. And those transportation networks rely on things like electricity and telecom as their pillars, and also on information and communication technology. So we have this whole collection of networks. Each network in its own has emergent behaviors. And now we're looking at how they interact with one another and trying to avoid things like cascading failures. So one of the, the thing that my research focuses on is the mathematics of networks, trying to understand how we can connect the structure, the physical structure of the network and the function of the network. So the dynamical process that's unfolding on top of it. So one of the main things that I work on is this thing of phase transitions. And we see in networks that uh, the extent of connectivity in a network, which is what's plotted in the vertical axis. So the fraction of nodes that are in then the largest connected component of a network. And this is the uh, number of edges in a network. So I've drawn a little network over here and you can, I colored in red, the largest connected component. And we see an abrupt change in the extent of connectivity in a network as we start throwing edges down at random. And you can imagine that there's many times that we want a network to be fully connected. If we think about the internet, we want every IP address to be reachable. If we think about the airline network, we want the whole world to be connected. Yet when a virus is spreading on that network, we really want to go to the other side and break up connectivity. So connectivity can be a great asset, but it can also be a liability. So a lot of my work focuses on when does that transition happen and what are interventions that can enhance or delay it. And another thing I work a lot on is cascading failures on complex networks. So things like cascading failures in electric grids, cascading failures in firing and brain that cause epileptic seizures, um, and also thinking about social networks. So cascades of influence, epidemic spreading, and cascades in social hierarchies. So just to give you a little flavor of the kind of work that I do. So I'm really interested in complex systems and emergent behaviors. And so I 
agreed to take on this role of being the Associate Dean of Research to bring a systems perspective thinking to our research enterprise in the college. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about our strategic research vision. So it started out about a year and a half ago with our main goal, which is to identify the research areas in which we have the potential to become the national leaders. And we really wanna make sure that we're addressing the most pressing challenges of our day that can be solved from engineering solutions. And our second goal is to become the national leaders in those areas after we've been identified. So we did a grassroots visioning exercise in the fall and winter of 2021, 2022. Mm -hmm. And with that, identified the pillars of, of our strategic research vision. So we have four pillars to that vision and a few cross-cutting areas. And this was done in very extensive consultation with all of our faculty. So very grassroots visioning exercise. And we came upon these four main areas, revolutionizing energy systems. So thinking about how we can enhance energy efficiency, generation and storage, strengthening climate resilience. So clearly climate is on the agenda, very front and center. And we wanna understand how we can mitigate some of the devastating effects from climate, including things like uh, new kinds of crops and uh, thinking about uh, building more resilient housing. And then we are also focused on transforming mobility and Zinfan Lin is going to tell us a lot about his work that's really leading cutting edge in that area. And so we want to think about the future of transport, especially as we move to autonomous unmanned vehicles, et cetera. And then advancing human health as we have an aging population coupled with great advances in sensors and um, medical diagnostics. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about all those areas. And then we have some cross cuts the main one being uh, technologies for the greater good or engineering for all. So leaving no community behind and also thinking about intelligent systems and automation. Uh, so machine learning and artificial intelligence and tools at the nano and micro scales. So I'm gonna give you a, a overview of where we stand. So in the spring of 2022, we unveiled our next level uh, uh, pillars and crosscuts that I just showed you. And we also did a substantial investment of about $270,000 of seed funds distributed to nine projects with faculty in seven departments. Uh, in the uh, fall of last year, we uh, convinced the provost to give us two faculty lines allotted to advancing our strategic research vision. So we have a search in full swing for two new faculty members to advance the areas of climate resilience and revolutioning energy, uh, revolutionizing energy systems. And we are coming to the apex of that search with seven candidates coming for on-campus interviews in the next couple of weeks. And we've got some really diverse young people. It's very exciting to see all the work that they're doing. And we have a lot of ongoing research forums and reporting out from of those uh, projects that we did fund. And I wanted to just put it on your radar that on March 16th, we're going to be doing a research showcase of these seed funded projects, along with a really exciting panel discussion about how to fund bold new ideas and build connections across the whole campus. And we certainly have some slots for alumni who are interested in attending. So if you would like to visit with us on March 16th from one to five in the afternoon, please contact Alan, whose email is right here. And I think that Aaron's gonna put it in the chat as well. So we'd certainly welcome your involvement and love to show you more of the details. But for now, I just wanted to give you a quick overview. And if you're interested in learning more, go to our college website and you'll see the about and the strategic vision next level research links. And it can take you to this page where we made movies uh, of all the PIs and uh, they gave us some brief overviews of their projects and visions. So they're really exciting movies. And then we also have a new brochure uh, where you can learn about how we're engineering a better world for all. So just to touch briefly on the areas that we are form our pillars, the first one being mobility. We hired two new mid-career faculty members 
Joshua Zhang and Carrie Watkins, who are doing really transformative work. And just to highlight two projects, uh, we're very interested in looking at the future of mobility involving airflow. So things like um, simulating the air taxis in San Francisco to develop regulations and also understand things like aeroacoustics and noise in an urban environment. And we're also working with some ultra high temperature ceramics to enable the next generation of hypersonic vehicles. In the space of health, we're doing really exciting things. One of our faculty members, Laura Marcou, just received $6.3 million from the National Institutes of Health to develop a national center on interventional biophotonics, which is going in in our newly developed Aggie Square. Um, we have a new center for neuroengineering, which is uh, looking at implanting uh, devices in people's brain to enable mobility in paralyzed people. Really exciting stuff. We also are working on um, crossing the blood brain barrier and using the body's own nanoparticles to deliver medicine to brains and looking at health diagnostics. So uh, using a lot of sensor networks and devices to uh, understand how to do diagnostics. And it also is advancing our efforts in machine learning. So doing machine learning on medical data is a whole new field. Um, in the area of energy, we're doing a lot of work with solar energy and looking at how to be very efficient with that. And some really exciting work converting waste streams into biofuels. So the weight byproducts from winemaking, from almond making. So all of the things that California is well known for and making these into great biofuels. Um, in climate resilience, we have some very exciting things happening with 3D printing of earthen houses. So using local sourced earth to 3D print structures that will be good for climate refugees and also have tremendous fire resilience. And uh, we have another faculty member who's trying to revolutionize the way that we make windmills. Um, so the uh, blades for the air turbines that are part of our renewable energy plan for California. And so thinking about how we can make these out of um, a waste, wood, waste products and um, bamboo and, my, and uh, mycelium, so mushrooms, uh, instead of using the current technology, which uses woods from the Amazon rainforest. So that's just a little bit of a highlight of the things that we're working on. And moving forward, as I mentioned, we have our next level research showcase on March 16th, and we're gonna do a next round of pitches and seed funding this year as well. And we're really working hard to build connections across campus. So partnering with the School of Medicine, School of Nursing, College of Letters and Science, College of Ag and Environmental Science, connecting with the grand challenges of UC Davis, connecting with Aggie Square, and partnering with our national labs. So just a little overview, high level, of the exciting things that we're trying to roll out at the college. So with that, I want to turn over the stage to our first faculty presenter, Heather Bischel, who's an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Thanks so much, Raisa, and hello to everyone on the call. It's really great to connect across uh, alumni from many different, you know, different backgrounds. Um, I'll be talking about my work on wastewater-based disease surveillance and its role in public health, so kind of fitting into the um, human health um, component of the strategic vision. So from, uh, you know, at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, there was this question around, can we use wastewater to help gather uh, really valuable public health data? Can wastewater actually be a way to survey and detect SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, um, as an early warning system for entry of the virus into different communities, despite the fact that it's a respiratory virus, right? So can we measure fecal um, shedding in a community-wide sample? And does that correlate to trends in in um, case counts in different communities. And the resounding result of many researchers across the country and across the globe has been, yes, that this is a really valuable tool for um, monitoring not only SARS-CoV-2, but other um, viral pathogens in wastewater. And we've seen that the 
wastewater can serve as a, um, a cost-effective way of gathering public health data to really inform public health decision makers. So since the start of the pandemic, um, the National Wastewater Surveillance System has been set up um, by the CDC, and there are contributors across the country into this, um, into this network, and it's being actively used on a regular basis. Um, my work in this area right now is looking at um, how can we identify and fill gaps in wastewater-based disease surveillance to um, promote health equity and to reach rural and disadvantaged communities. So I, um, I lead a project called Healthy Central Valley Together, where we're partnering with eight cities in the Central Valley um, in three counties, and we work uh, with UC Merced and our partners in a project um, led out of Stanford to bring wastewater-based disease surveillance into areas where data is lacking and where um, transmission, transmission rates may be higher and there are um, poor health outcomes as a result of infectious diseases. Um, this project really built out of my work from Healthy Davis together. So for those of you who were living in Davis, um, and through the beginning of the pandemic in the first couple of years, you'll know Healthy Davis Together because it was an extremely expansive program that um, brought us access to asymptomatic testing services. My um, charge on this project was to launch a wastewater-based disease surveillance program in the city of Davis. So you can see the purple there, that's our sewer shed. So that's the area of Davis that where the wastewater is collected for our 70,000 residents. Just next door to us, Sacramento has around 1.6 million people who contribute into the wastewater um, sewer network, and that's all treated at one location. And that wastewater can be monitored and give us an idea about trends and in infections. So, it, it, so it's a much more cost-effective tool than individual case counts and can really fill in some data gaps. Um, we were fortunate with Healthy Davis together to really dive into wastewater monitoring at different scales. So we set up subsidy um, sampling throughout the city of Davis. Each of these colored regions was a different sampler that we deployed in our, our maintenance holes um, to, to evaluate to what degree can we use higher resolution sampling to inform the public and initiate change in behavior. So um, directing folks to asymptomatic testing or symptomatic testing services if we saw changes in um, community levels of, in the wastewater. And you can log on to the, or just um, open up the COVID-19 campus dashboard. We're continuing wastewater monitoring for the UC Davis campus. And it's one of the kind of remaining tools that we have to understand the trends and the, ri the rise and fall of cases through time. Um, and last week, we, we went even more deeply to explore the use of this tool at the building scale for clusters of different buildings and setting out maintenance, um, maintenance whole surveillance to help inform our compliance with testing requirements or to try to identify outbreaks before they could occur. Right? So this can be applied at many different scales. And right now we're focusing at the city scale because of its um, cost effectiveness and ability to inform public health um, officers at the county level. One of the amazing things um, about Healthy Davis Together was that we had this extensive um, testing site. So we have some of the best testing data available from the period of November 2020 to about June 2022. As many of you know, testing was hard to get in many places. And so the validation of wastewater data against testing data can be compromised depending on the quality of the public health data that was available at that time. So um, we have this really wonderful data and an extensive network of, um, of folks in the city of Davis and on campus at UC Davis who came together to help evaluate the effectiveness of this tool. So one of the examples of our, our data set, this is from the City of Davis Wastewater Treatment Plant Influent, um, that y-axis, this N over PMMOV metric, is measuring the nucleocapsid, um, a, a genetic marker for the nucleocapsid protein of the virus. And then we also monitor a, um, a plant virus called pepper mild model virus to help account for process control. So the metric is somewhat unfamiliar to public health officials, but what you can see is that black line correlates really well with what we were seeing from that excellent case data that we saw um, in the city of Davis, right? And this has been seen in many other locations as well. The actual, you know, correlations may change depending on the sewer system, um, but we saw that effectively here. 
as folks transitioned to using antigen-based home tests and data was not being reported to public health, we saw more of a decoupling of wastewater data from clinical and public health data. So you can see that black line now kind of showed this increase in cases in, in May and June of 2022, whereas the case counts that we were getting from that data were quite um, diminished. And at the termination of Healthy Davis together, that gray line, it just drops down to the baseline altogether, right? So wastewater moving forward can continue to help fill these types of data gaps. And we want to try to um, expand that and understand how we can apply this to um, increase health equity in, in low resource areas. Um, so some of the research directions in my group, um, we're looking back now at this rich set of data that we have from wastewater and the um, and the Healthy Davis Together public health data and trying to see um, what we can do to forecast future case counts, positivity rates, and other public health relevant metrics like the effective R value, um, things you may have heard in, of um, for public health officers. And we're also trying to correlate and utilize other sources of data to complement the wastewater data. So one example is using Google search terms that can also be an indicator, an early indicator of um, new infections of different types into the community. Can we ground truth our wastewater data against that? Another example is um, we're thinking about how we can expand this tool to measure other respiratory and enteric viruses in wastewater. So multiplexing many different viruses. And we're doing this now um, through the Healthy CV Together um, project that you can look at on the website noted there. And we're looking at testing enrichment and sequencing panels to make this um, surveillance tool even broader and try to look for emerging pathogens. And lastly, in a collaboration that um, I work on with Lawrence Livermore National Lab, UC Berkeley and UC San Francisco, we're trying to develop new tools to detect emerging and novel viruses and understand virus infectivity in wastewater, right? So wastewater isn't a route of transmission for SARS-CoV-2, but it is for many other pathogens and it could be for other respiratory viruses. So my team is developing proteomics tools and human virus culture to better assess um, the ability to detect new pathogens. So I just want to take a second to kind of step back and um, recognize how amazing it is to be a part of the UC Davis community because we had collaborators, you know, from the medical school, from the genome center, statistics, mathematics, biostatistics, veterinary medicine, um, as well as within our community in the city of Davis, the California Department of Public Health, our county public health officers, our facilities teams that were out doing sampling, and all came together to make Healthy Davis together possible, and then in our extension to Healthy Central Valley together, a continued initiative around this. And so it's it's really wonderful to be a part of such a enthusiastic and diverse network. Um, and I lastly, I just want to thank my um, students and team. We had a lot of new folks join in. All but one person on that left photo was new to my team since the pandemic. And um, in order to respond to the COVID demands and run our wastewater monitoring program and my team on the right here that continues this work and our, our research objectives moving forward. I'll pass it back to you, Raisa. Thank you, Heather. It's really fascinating and such high impact. So does anyone in the audience have a question that they'd like to ask? I haven't seen any come in on the chat. So if you'd like to, please unmute yourself and ask. And I if not, oh, please. I remember not too long ago, some of the uh, studies being done in the Silicon Alley, Valley area saying that there was a high incidence of a new version of COVID. And has and I'm surprised that we haven't been more uh, re uh, reactive to that with the greater um, masking and, uh, and going back to where we were before. Has that happened? Yeah, it's it's really interesting, actually, and what we are able to um, identify different variants through the wastewater through tailored um, uh, PCR assays or through sequencing to to see this kind of influx of new variants that come in and pass through our public health officer in Yolo County uses the wastewater data on a regular basis, not only for, you know, she had, for example, delayed some um, 
reductions in, in masking recommendations because there was some lingering trends in the wastewater that wasn't showing up in case counts otherwise, or vice versa to help build confidence in the trends that are that are coming down. So I think that you know this data is being used actively in that way, but um, you know our our public health departments are responding to a whole complex um, set of information and trends in, in responding to those different variants. I have a question. Uh, I'm a, uh, a graduate of uh, Chemi in uh, 1980 and now at Medi in the medical school in pediatrics. And I'm fascinated by this and just the nuts and bolts. How does one get one's samples? <laughs> yeah, so this is a whole area of, of depends on where you are, right? But how, how do you break the pipe, so to speak? <laughs> well, the maintenance holes that we have around town, right? Those lifted up. We actually have um, within the city for our neighborhood level sampling, uh, we have auto samplers. They're, you know, essentially pumps with a programmer on it that we can drop down into the system with an X bar and they hang below the street. People are driving over them and collect over a 24 hour period, a composite sample that, that then serves as a representation of the community. That same kind of auto sampler is often present at the front end of a wastewater treatment plant to measure all kinds of water quality parameters that we need to ensure you know, we treat our wastewater well before we discharge or reuse it for um, safe purposes. Or you can walk up, the first step of a treatment plant is settling. Solids come down to the bottom and we've seen that the solids at the bottom of that primary clarifier, we call it, or the sludge, has very high concentrations of SARS-CoV-2. That lipid envelope of the virus is kind of sticky. So it gets onto those solids and we can sample it and get really sensitive measurements from that. And transit time great, from- I'm sorry, Bob, to interrupt you, but um, we really are, need to stay on track. And I know we could ask Heather tons of questions about health equity and all these brand new viruses. It's really inspiring. Sorry to cut you off and limit you to just the one. Um, and please keep sending questions to the chat if we'll have time at the end for a broader discussion. But so we don't lose too much track of time, I wanted to move to our next speaker, who is uh, Professor Marina Leite. And she is an associate professor in the um, Department of Material Science and Engineering. Thank you very much, Raisa. Um, thank you everyone for uh, being here today and, and thank you so much for the, for the opportunity to share a little bit of the work that I, we've been doing in my group. So as mentioned, I'm in material science and engineering and um, in, a, in a, my group, we're actually uh, quite focused on uh, um, looking at functional materials for renewable energy and uh, sustainability in general. Sorry, let me go back here once. So basically, um, we have been working uh, very well aligned with the next vision of a, of a research for the college in a different front. So primarily on a, a revolutionizing energy systems through solar cells, I would say, and that's most of the work that I'll be talking to you today. And with respect to that, we have been doing um, quite a lot of work on two different cross cuttings, which are um, tools at the nanoscale, as well as a, uh, um, sorry, for some reason here, yes, as well as uh, the use of a machine learning models so that we can uh, forecast how materials behave. So I'd like to, before sharing any of the, the overview, you know, and uh, some of our results, I would like to thank the team members in, uh, in, uh, in, in my group. So I would say that the PhD students, they have done a, an amazing um, work during the pandemic, implementing um, a lot of uh, the new instrumentation that we have and actually acquiring data and getting to the whole point in which we could already share some of the stories with the scientific community. So they've been doing an outstanding uh, uh, job here and I'm very proud of working with them. Now, in terms of, uh, uh, of the type of work that we've been doing, so I mentioned to you folks, solar energy harvesting. We also do a lot of work on uh, uh, different types of materials for sustainability and also for photocatalysis. But the topic of today will be more related to the potential of machine learning so that we can advance the understanding of uh, materials for photovoltaics, for solar cells. Now, needless to say that we have enough uh, um, resource, right, as the sun. Uh, um, so basically what we've been trying to do in my group and the overall big picture is to find the new materials or enhance the properties, the electronic and uh, uh, the electrical and optical properties of materials so that we can make a better use of those. Now, what is a busy and extremely relevant graph here from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory showing to us 
is actually the where the record cell solar cell efficiency as a function of time for all the technologies that are, are possible, not necessarily commercialized yet, but that have been confirmed as a viable technology. So you can see here that it's color coded, right? And then a blue represents a silicon solar cell. So we have a very long, a decade long history with silicon in which we could uh, um, leverage all the knowledge from microelectronics, right? And bring that to develop a solar cells. We also have a semi complex a type of design such as multi-junction solar cells that are very useful for a space type of application. And then here in the red, in this portion of the, the graph, we actually have a variety of more emerging materials. And if I now zoom in into that, we can see here that we have in red the so-called hybrid organic inorganic perovskite. So that's a type of material that actually entails a, a well-defined structure that has this uh, uh, type here of uh, ABX3. And uh, one of the key points of these hybrid perovskites for solar cells is the fact that we can make them using very low cost techniques and we can achieve a power conversion efficiencies that are at the same level as silicon. So here now in the zoom in, we can see that this little yellow dot is really, really close to the blue one that corresponds to silicon. So that's amazing. One, because we could actually replace the silicon uh, solar modules by perovskites, which are um, a much uh, uh, lower in cost and also would enable us to make the, the modules flexible. And we could also pair them in dual junction type of device, basically revolutionizing the landscape of the silicon market, which currently dominates 90% as a material. So that would be a huge deal. Now, one of the, uh, the challenges here with this material, the hybrid perovskites, is the fact that uh, uh, it is not as stable yet. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So one of the big picture goals is to actually identify what are the operating conditions and also the resting conditions of this material, because um, as uh, many animals in nature, the perovskites, they actually need a good night of sleep so that they can recover their performance. So it turns out that because we have uh, all these different possibilities for the, the position here of the A cation, as well as the D here, there's a goldish color, and also the little edges of the octahedra here, the purple, they highlight the hyperparameter space that we're dealing with is um, enormous in terms of uh, how many chemical compositions would be suitable, not only for solar cells, but also actually for light emitting diodes for LED types of applications. So let me see if my video will play here. It is not playing for me, so I don't know if you folks can see it. Hmm. Anyway, so I won't play the, the animation, but the point here is that besides the fact that we have all these possible chemical compositions, it turns out that, as I mentioned to you, the hybrid perovskites, they are unstable, so they work super well as a solar cell, but not for too long. Sometimes they degrade after a few months, sometimes even after a few seconds. And the, one of the main material science challenges here is the fact that once these perovskite materials are exposed to water and or oxygen or voltage or temperature or light, they change. And sometimes these changes are reversible and other times it actually leads to permanent material degradation. So if we combine the possible variations that we have here, right, based on these environmental stressors, the effect, the individual and the combined effect of these environmental stressors, as well as the fact that a lot of uh, uh, the, the degradation processes that we'll see are chemical composition dependent, we are left with a, a high dimensional parameter space and it turns out that it would be um, nearly um, impossible, I would say, to make use of a trial and error additional um, approaches here to test every single chemical composition and a test the effect of uh, each individual environmental stressor as well as its combined effects. So that motivates us to make use of uh, machine learning models in my group so that we can uh, forecast the response of these hybrid perovskites. So I'll share with you uh, some of our uh, of our recent findings and how we have been using machine learning to accelerate the development and the understanding of these hybrid perovskites. So more specifically, we combine uh, um, high throughput experiments with a, a machine learning assisted analysis of a whole lot of data. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in the next few minutes so that we can again uh, predict how these materials would degrade. <clears throat> now, this is a work in progress here. And you know, basically, uh, the first PhD students that have worked on that, they essentially uh, developed what we call a roadmap on how to use a machine learning to um, advance the understanding of perovskites. And we can make use of machine learning at different stages, from composition of screening all the way to device development. And I'll move on from that a little bit 
and I'll tell that uh, in today's presentation, I'll focus on our work on uh, um, understanding and predicting material stability. So then in, a, in, a, in a my lab, which is located in Camper, if anyone wants to visit, please contact me. More than welcome uh, uh, to stop by any time and take a look on the experiments that we're doing. We developed a customized setup so that we can essentially mimic environmental conditions in which we can very, very carefully relative humidity, temperature, you know, and, and a light conditions. And then we acquire over 7,000 spectra in less than a week. And when I say spectra, I'm referring to photoluminescence, which is an optical measurement that we can acquire very quickly in a fraction of seconds. And it's extremely informative from a thin film and material level all the way to full device. So basically we mimic here typical um, summer days in Northern California. California. And the idea is that we split our data in two so that we can uh, train and validate as well as test the data. So I'll show to you a little bit of the work that we've done on uh, comparing three different machine learning models. The first one of being a linear regression, which is a uh, quite simple. And I would say that the accuracy varies a lot depending on the chemical composition. So we decided to then actually apply something uh, significantly more sophisticated, a neural network, in which we've seen that we can do better, but it still depends on the chemical composition and the, uh, the time-dependent behavior that we have on this photoluminescence. We lose a track of what's going on. And then uh, that motivated us to actually develop a statistical model, a machine learning assisted statistical model that has all these variables that basically take into consideration um, seasonal trends and also the past behavior of uh, the photoluminescence. And by adding all that, we can actually do a significantly better job. So overall, we've applied this type of methodology to different chemical compositions. And we have seen that as we increase the level of complexity of the machine learning model, we can uh, attain a really high accuracy here above a 90% um, in, a, in a, a lot of the cases, which is a chemical composition independent. So with that, I will stop and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. That's very inspiring. Does anyone have a question that they'd like to ask in the audience? I, I hope I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about um, the recovery. I thought that that was very interesting that these materials degrade and then recover with some rest. Could you tell us a little bit about how that happened? Sure. Y yes. So um, turns out that that. Uh, um, Often when we expose these materials to light, which we need for a cell or cell to work, um, there are uh, processes that happen at the nanoscale. And uh, one in particular, which is um, ionic motion, that actually can lead to some uh, um, significant changes in the electrical responses. So as a result of that, we see that the, the voltage that the cell can generate decays a lot. So the idea is to actually identify resting conditions that, um, for instance, would uh, um, coincide with the night, right? So that we don't have sunlight or at least a, something that we could, you know, for example, turn off the solar panels for an hour if needed, depending on the temperature, you know, at a certain moment of the day or the relative humidity, if there is a, an issue with encapsulation of those panels so that we can uh, uh, prevent a permanent degradation. So the idea of the three R cycle in which we uh, reap energy, rest and recover, right, uh, is, uh, I would say, the holy grail right now. And I think that's something that it's going to take us um, a little bit of time to get to that point. So it is part of one of our longer term goals to actually um, be able to um, identify these resting conditions that are needed so that we can actually have uh, um, lasting solar cells made out of these cheap materials. Very exciting. So is the flexibility. Um, so we have a question that came into the chat and let, we can answer that in the end when we have an open Q&A, or uh, Marina might want to answer it as we move on to our next speaker, which is uh, Professor Jinpan Lin, who's an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. All right. Um, so, Raisa, thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, so, I'm going to share uh, my our work on a man's aerial system, which is related to transforming mobility. Uh, so here's a brief overview of my research team, uh, Energy System Automation and Integration Lab, which has been up and running for like over six years now. And these are the great graduate students I have, which basically make everything happen. And also the responses for providing the funding support. And so regarding our work on aerial mobility and transportation, um, so specifically, we have been working on the like so-called multi-rotor drones or small-scale uh, small aircraft. So basically just like drones with multiple rotors. 
So you have, I think you guys probably have seen this a lot these days, and they, they have also emerging as the critical parts of our future transportation logistic networks. So at this point, the people are using it for like surveying, mapping, area photography, and uh, also like people are talking about drone delivery or like even flying cars for urban mobility service, which Risa actually like touched upon uh, previously. Um, so they are so popular mainly due to the advantages in uh, maneuverability, right? Because uh, they can do things like hovering and uh, vertical takeover landing. And also because like they're smaller and uh, distributed uh, proportional units can be more easily electrified so they can achieve like zero emission eventually. Uh, but uh, among all the good things, the, the, there are several major challenges with, um, with um, the drones. Uh, I mean, the first multi rollers. So the first one, the major one is the flight time and range. So the status quo is that um, at this point, like the decimated scale drone that we've seen daily, they are limited to up to 30 minutes of flight time. So what we really need is one to five hours if we want to do drone delivery or like flying car on a large scale. So you may be wondering why it's so hard to extend the range of the, uh, of the UAV, uh, of the drone. And uh, uh, so why can't we just stack barriers like what we did to electro vehicles? Um, so according to this figure shows in here, um, if we try to add a certain amount of berries to the UAV, then 25% of the waste needs to be spent on the packaging. And then another 10% uh, of the energy level needs to be reserved for like chemical stability and safety um, considerations. And then 20% to accommodate the battery degradation over lifetime. And another 19% needs to be reserved for the minimum flight requirements by FAA. So if we take all of those amounts out, we only have like 26% left. So therefore, we are talking about a roughly like 300% of overhead. So comparing these numbers, our 60% grant proposal overhead doesn't look that bad. So anyway, so that's why it's so hard, right? It's so challenged to deal with this issue. Um, so therefore, we need solution from all friends. Like we need a better energy source, like high energy density batteries, um, and then also better design configurations, more efficient components, and also lightweight materials. And last but not least, we also need better uh, flight control and mission planning. So which is our current research focus. So we try to actually like, for example, optimize the maneuvers to, to find the, the most energy saving velocities, attitudes and acceleration for uh, UAV operations. And also what is the best trajectory to flying from one point to another point and also mission planning. So what if we have multiple waypoints, what is the best order to traverse um, all of them? Um, so the basis for doing all this is the understanding of the integrated multi-physical dynamics of the UAVs. So how is the drone powered? So we need to deal with like the uh, energy source, the battery, it has with its own like electrodynamics, which will be coupled with the electromechanical dynamics of the motor and also the aerodynamics of the propeller to generate the thrust and torque. And then finally, uh, the rigid body dynamics of the airframe. So we try to construct a model and to capture all these dynamics and also more importantly, their coupling and interplay with each other. So then we can try to use this model for um, analysis and optimizations. Um, so so then we, we try to deal with some, some of the, the, the research questions. So the first one is the simplest. So suppose we try to fly a drone over a straight line. What is the best cruising velocity? And uh, we try to quantify the energy efficiency by using the metrics energy consumed per meter traveled and then we try to study the relationship uh, with respect to the velocities. So this is the curve uh, that we have come up with. We can see that this is a nonlinear uh, relationship and um, so uh, governed by, affected by all the previous mentioned um, system dynamics. And uh, so including trade-off factors such as velocity, drag resistance, rotor aerodynamics, and also motor efficiency. So we can see that there's a sweet spot where right? there's a kind of a certain velocities so that we can cruise the, the drone, which was, uh, be most energy efficient. And we've also shown that uh, in order to find this velocity correctly, we need to consider all the previous mentioned dynamics, which is not every work has been doing at this point. For example, if we don't consider the inflow aerodynamics of the propeller, the curve will actually flatten out and then the optimum velocity will move to this point. And if we try to cruise at this velocity, the true energy consumption, which will be up here, is actually 68% more than the true optimum. And we have also tried to look at the dynamics of the, the batteries, its impact, and it turns out that it will actually have uh, major impacts on the maximum proportion uh, capability. It can actually affect the uh, proportion capability up to like 12%. Um, and then besides all this, we can also try to look at the other aspects of this problem. For example, what if the drone becomes heavier? Well, for example, if we increase the payload, 
What do you think we should fly the drone at? Like, should we actually fly it faster or slower to save energy? So based on our study, actually 10 hours speed, we need to fly it actually a bit faster. So based on the these figures that we have come up with. So this is kind of a little bit kind of uh, counterintuitive. And then so we kind of uh, interesting to looking at what's behind that. And uh, I actually asked my wife about, about this question. So she's a non-engineering major. What do you think? Uh, like we should fly it faster or slower based on your intuition. So she says that it needs to be fly faster. So which is actually a little bit disappointing to me, but I think that's probably because of my past record and bad taste of asking her trick questions. So anyway, so we have to also look at the problem behind this. This is also because of complicated interplay with all the um, involved system dynamics. So the next thing we look at is like how to fly the drone like dynamically to save energy. So suppose that, right? So what is the basically, right? What is the optimal maneuver to flying between two points? So we try to formulate a mathematical optimization problem, all right? So that is minimizing the energy consumptions, which is the integral of the power over the whole flight. And uh, we try to solve this problem based on a model. And then, um, so here's the solutions. Uh, we have, uh, I have a kind of a testing footage here, shows like the kind of maneuvers. We can see that the drone will first try to pitch like swiftly at the beginning to get to the uh, pitch angle corresponding to the uh, optimum cruising velocity. And then we'll try to cruise at the best velocity and then deaccelerate a little bit when it's approaching the end using that wind drag. And then finally do a swift and precise braking at the end. Um, so we have also extended analysis to the uh, to the arbitrary point in 3D space, not just like level flights, but also um, diagonal flights as well. Um, and then, then we can go one level up, that is mission planning. So suppose that we have a bunch of waypoints as shown here. So what is the most energy saving order of traversing all of them? Um, so it appears to be a salesman's problem, right? You may be thinking, right? We just find the minimum distance order, right? That will be it but it turns out to be not the case. Um, so like if we just try to look at the minimum distance order, so which will be shown by the dashed line here. And uh, so the total distance uh, for this set is about like 284 meters. And then we're looking at energy consumption of 45 kilo, uh, kilojoule using the uh, controller that we optimized previously for energy uh, performance. And then 70 kilojoule if we use the unoptimized controller. Um, but if we actually try to find the order that can minimize the energy consumption, it is turns out to be this um, blue ones. And then so the total distance is a little bit longer, 300 meters, but it's the energy consumption is like 40 kJ and then 50 kJ uh, kind of respectively, which actually like saves quite a amount of energy. So from here, the takeaway is that minimum energy order does not necessarily mean minimum distance. And uh, so there's actually a lot going on behind the scene. So for example, like the minimum energy order also try to kind of avoid frequent vertical motions, which is turned out to be much less efficient than uh, the other, than the normal operations. And also another takeaway here is that uh, the total energy saving can be achieved by both smart planning and control can be significant. So we're talking about like 40 kilojoules versus like 60 kilojoules, which is about like 70%. Um, difference. So finally, looking uh, forward, uh, in the short term, we will try to complete our current work on flight control and mission planning. We try to make thing, everything computationally efficient, which can be done online. And then uh, over the midterm, we try to extend to and integrate with the design of the UAVs, for example, how to do the same thing, but under new configuration of their, of their systems. And over the long term, we will also try to scale up to larger applications. So we may want to actually look at the, the larger uh, multivirus, which can fly people. Uh, in future. So that's all I have. Thanks very much. And I would like to address your questions. Thank you, Xinfan. It's really ambitious how you're building these very complex systems with so many parts. Does anybody have a question that they'd like to ask Xinfan? Uh, Heather, you have a question. I don't want to steal away from our LMs, but I was curious if you um, thought about kind of biomimicry and flights of bird paths and kind of the, you know, um, formations in terms of energy savings and potential integration? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So that's actually part of the, the, the future work. The last slides I didn't delve into like deeply, but that's definitely something that's um, uh, like, well, that's interesting, right? So one thing is that, right, there are actually, like you said, right, there are actually new configurations of uh, UAVs, like multi-drones coming up or like just aircraft coming up. So we try to mimic like the bio, like the biology system we have seen, which is like has been flying very efficiently for very long period of time. So it'll be interesting to model those systems and then try to also uh, come up with the control like uh, 
kind of control algorithms which can achieve similar energy efficiency. So that's one thing. And the other directions we are also looking at is actually like uh, not just like a single UAV. What if we have like multiple of them, and then we try to actually fly a, like swarm of them? How to actually coordinate their their motions so that can they can complete like mission or certain tasks like to achieve like the overall like uh, like best efficiency? So that's also definitely something that is very interesting. So very cool. Thanks. And there's a question in the chat. How many rotors is the optimum in terms of control and energy? So those are uh, clearly a situational dependent question too, I imagine. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, we haven't actually like uh, a, a study that as of yet, um, but we do have we, we have we do we do have play with different number of rotors. So we have actually octo rotor in our lab and also a core rotor. So like four rotors and eight rotors. And uh, um, yeah, but I, I think that's um uh, so to answer to your question, right? I, I think it's it's may actually like may not be a straightforward answer. Like so just like definitely like what, what number of loaders will be will be actually like um the optimum. It's probably gonna depend on actually like the, the type of the mission and then type of the maneuver that you will be expecting you to actually like um uh, perform. And then also I think it's also related to probably the length of the mission as well. But this is definitely a very interesting uh a question, a problem to 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 look into. I have to say that one thing that I, it struck me that is similar amongst these three different topics that are so rich, each one of them on their own, is that everyone's dealing with a very high dimensional landscape. There's a lot of parameters, there's a lot of different knobs that can be explored to see how they impact the outcomes that you're interested in. Um, Aaron, do we have time for another question or is it time for the raffle? Um, we could take one more quick question. So there's a question that came in the chat. Can I ask what software computational fluid dynamics program are used for analysis? I think that's a question for me, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, like uh, uh, for the questions, Mr. Lee, for the questions. Um, yeah. So uh, because like we're doing control stuff, so we're not actually using CFD because like uh, we we try to do things like optimization, real time control. Um, so the CFD code is actually like uh, not very computationally efficient for us to um, to actually run, it's especially right if you want to do mission control and planning in real time. So we basically have been using kind of reduce our mo model and then we de develop our own code and then implement this in in Python, and then so that it can be actually like uh, like like implemented in in kind of uh, the the flight control that we have on board the UAV. But we do have actually like run some CFD program to validate some of the some of the results that we that's coming out of the flight testing results. All right, thank you so much. That was amazing. I have learned so much new information tonight, um, and I just want to give a very very warm thank you to each of our wonderful presenters, and a big thank you to our audience for all of your questions. Um, if you had a question that we did not have a chance to answer, we will make sure to follow up with you individually to get your question answered. I think most of them uh, did get an answer in the chat. So I am going to put my email address here in case something you thought of something you didn't put in the chat that you want to ask. Um, or if we miss anything, please, anytime, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to make connections. Uh, just really quick before we do our raffle, I wanted to share about some upcoming events that we have here at the College of Engineering. We have our intro to design showcase coming up later this month, which you can participate as an evaluator in virtually. It's really fun. Um, for those of you who are local or coming back for picnic day, we're going to have an alumni lounge and we love for you to stop by and give day happens online uh, that same weekend. We have a really fantastic Dean's Distinguished Speaker Series um, featuring Kim Budil, who is the director of the Lawrence Livermore National Lab and a double Aggie. Uh, and then, of course, there's the engineering design showcase with our graduating seniors in June um, for anyone who's local that wants to evaluate for that as well. Uh, our next engineering on tap will be in the Sacramento area, so stay tuned for that date. It's coming out soon. And if you have, uh, if you want to know anything else about our events or uh, sign up for any of these, you can always visit us online. I'll drop that link in the chat as well. Okay, that's the end of our slideshow, and I am going to do our raffle winners. 
Uh, we ran a random number generator during the program and we applied the chosen numbers to our participant list uh, based on where you all fell on that. And so based on all of that, our raffle winners are Ryan Callahan of the class of 2021. Congratulations, Ryan. And Ted Odell from the class of 1978. Thank you so much, Ted and Ryan, uh, for being here and congratulations. We will follow up with you via email to secure your details uh, and to provide you with your e-gift cards. All right, well, that is all she wrote. So if you have any questions or you need anything from your College of Engineering, please reach out to me. Uh, take good care and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. We'll stay on the line just for a minute or so in case there are any really burning questions, um, but otherwise we bid you all a very, very good night. Is the engineering department going to be open for picnic day? What? Yes, we the engineering department has lots of exhibits going on. Many of our departments will be set up uh, and you'll be able to, to see your favorite departments for sure. All right, any other burning questions? Otherwise, we will go ahead and say good night, everybody. Take care. Bye.